thank you again to the team who led us in worship this morning, lifting our hearts to the Lord. Beautiful music. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is going to begin at Philippians 3, verse 12. I know some of you um, do it online. Uh, I'm using the NIV translation. That's the one I use as a standard one, uh, the most recent edition of the NIV. So if it's a little bit different than what you have, um, you know, that, that will help explain it. Uh, the scripture reading will begin at Philippians 3, verse 12, and go through chapter 4, verse 1. And this is where Paul is writing or saying, not that I have already obtained all this or already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have, you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. About every five or ten years, somebody will ask me a question that startles me, and it startles me every single time. And they say, John, what goals do you have in life? I don't know how to answer that. So I'm kind of stepped back on my heels, and I go through my normal delaying tactic, and that is, uh, what do you mean personal goals or professional goals while my mind is running here? And, of course, you know what the answer is. <laughs> Both. Okay. Well, let me ask you. Do you have any goals? I'm not just talking about what you have for what plans you have, but do you have any goals, personal goals for yourself of what you want to achieve in life personally? Or goals professionally? Do you have any goals? Today, well, <laughs> you can expand that, of course. Um, goals as a church, goals in the school, just whatever goals you may have. Today, we're going to be seeing, uh, God had this passage written here for us so that we can see Paul being moved by the Spirit, setting a goal. And God wants to let us all in on that. Okay, in order to get a grasp of what that goal is, we actually need to go back a couple of verses in chapter 3 to what we looked at last time, verses 10 and 11. And you, uh, we have that uh, uh, verse 10 and 11. Let me get it myself here. Um, he, Paul is saying, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, okay? Resurrection from the dead. When you're young, you don't think of that very much. But if you listen in on conversations of older people, Listen, 
They talk about their aches and their pains, and they just can't move like they used to, and so on and so on. And if it's a group of Christians, eventually they'll come to this point saying, I can't wait to get my resurrection body. Okay, and then, of course, that expands the talk. Okay, what do we talk about resurrection body? What's that going to be like? Will we have brown hair and brown eyes again, or will it be different? What will we look like? And I'm thinking I'm getting rid of these stupid things, these glasses. And, uh, okay, what are we going to be like? All right, that's the rest. And uh, Paul is saying, I'm looking at my resurrection body. Now we go into our text, verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or already arrived at my goal. Do, do, do you get that? Resurrection body, obtaining that, and achieving that as a goal. Well, by the way, that word um, goal, I guess that's, you can translate that. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a little different nuance in the original. It's saying, look at your resurrection body. It's complete. And that's that first blank in the outline. Complete. Perfect physique. No defects. Sharp mind, pure heart, radiant person. You can't improve on it. Complete. He says, I've not already obtained all that, but notice the language. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Whoa. Um... This is a kind of language more than just speculating. Well, I wonder what the resurrection body is going to be like. No, he says, I see it. It's whole. It's complete. And I'm going to go for it. All right. Well, then we go into verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do. Let me pause there. You need a team or committee to work on a building project? Get Paul. He's a driven guy. He's got a goal in mind, and he's one thing I do. I'm going to go for it. Whoa. That is a driven guy that you want on your team. Okay, if that's the case, being driven, to, to, uh, how do you obtain that now? How do you start getting that new resurrection self now? Well, we're still here in verse 13. He says, there, there's two things, and you'll see that in the outline, too, that it, First, we identified what the goal is. And now how to achieve that goal, two major things. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Okay. First, the forgetting what is behind. All right. And that's that blank, of course, that forgetting. In other words, he's saying, as I'm going for that goal... There's things in my life that I'm going to forget. I'm going to put it behind me. Okay, what kinds of things? So if you're kind of putting a sermon together and preparing it and you ask that question, what kind of things do you put behind? Well, you kind of look at the context a little bit. You, and I make the references here. You can look at them up yourself if you want to. Um, chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. His brag list, um, things he's accomplished. Um, today's lingo, uh, what, what we got in track, the medals we got in track, even if you went to the Olympics and got gold medal, if you got your decrees, 
You've got this long brag list of everything you've accomplished, all the places you've traveled, this brag list. <laughs> Put it behind me. Not part of my life anymore. It's just not going to be important anymore. Okay, then I look at Philippians 2, verses 1 through 2. And differences and squabbles you have with other Christians? I'd love to take a poll and see how honest you are. Um, did you have a squabble with anybody this past week? Um, and if you wouldn't raise your hand, I would know who the unhonest people are. <laughs> okay? Most everybody's got a squabble with somebody. Put it behind. Just go through the work and effort of putting it behind you. Um, then I also quickly reference Psalm 103, verse 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, east, uh, whatever, east, wherever east and west is, <laughs> that's how far your sins are removed. That's the way God sees it. Your sins, the things you've done wrong, I put them in the past, particularly I put them on my son Jesus. They're gone. Put it behind you. And when you want to point out the wrongs of somebody else, <laughs> put it behind you. Go through the work and effort of forgiveness. Put it behind you. So you see, Paul is saying, here is the resurrection party, my complete self. And when I'm there, all that stuff is going to be gone. Why wait? Start it now. That's how you start achieving the resurrection. Okay. He also goes later on into something else uh, that I just, um, I didn't know how to, how to work this, so I just summarized it as the world, a worldly way of thinking and so on. Um, <clears throat> go to verse 18. For as I've often told you before and now tell you again even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, Eventually, you're going to leave behind those that want to have nothing to do with Christ. Uh, a sad incident in my own life is where many years ago I was part of a ministerial association. And we did projects as, um, as an association. One of those projects was to establish a safe house for those women who were abused and so on. And one of my ministerial colleagues, we became really good friends, real good buddies. And uh, until I found out, he's not a Christian. He really doesn't believe that the way back to God is through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for you, and that you embrace that. Um, it, it was sad for me. And one time I said to him, I won't say his name, um, I'd like to encourage you to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to come back to God and be his child. And he said, John, they tried to do that to me in college, but please, don't, don't do that to me, okay? And so I respected him. I just backed off. After that, we could still work on the project together, but we couldn't be buddies because of the influence he could have on me. In his own way, he was living as an enemy of Christ. Somehow, I needed to let that go. There's something else that uh, I include in the world. That is verse 19. It says, for their destiny is, their, is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Ooh, that hurts. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Why did I say that hurts? 
I think of this verse almost every time I go to a buffet place. Who likes here like buffet? You like buffet? Whoa, come on. <laughs> I love them. And if you ever go with me to a buffet, I can guarantee your eyes are going to get a little wider as you watch me eat. It's amazing what I can fit into this stomach here. Now, Barb has never quoted this verse to me. She's very kind, but uh, is your God your stomach? <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Does this mean we can never have a buffet meal? No. What it means is it's not the reason you live just for that. That you're focused on this. That you want everything just to fulfill your bodily appetites in an extreme way. That's a characteristic of those that lost their orientation in the universe. Rather, all of this fixation on these things. What's going to happen at the final resurrection? All that's going to fade. I'm not going to be fixated on buffets anymore. Because I will be whole and complete. Probably still eating in the new resurrection body, but I won't need a buffet. Paul is saying here, there are many things in your life that when you are in that complete new self at the end of human history, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that you're going to put behind you, forget, and no longer part of your life. Start it now. Why wait? You can start achieving that complete self now by putting things behind. Okay, back to verse 13 where we started uh, going into this. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And I think that's the blank in the outline. Yeah, straining. All our kids were in track. Uh, they were quite athletic and um, taking after Barb. I don't have an athletic bone in my body, but they um, took after Barb and they were in track. And if you've been to track meets, uh, a couple of the emotionally intense events are, well, the 100-meter dash or a 100-meter sprint. That's, of course, always uh, very intense. But also, what really gets the crowds riveted are the relay races, 4x100, 4x2, 4x4, et cetera. All right? It's where you have the baton, and you're the first person taking off, and you're giving it your all, and then the next person is going to take the baton, and that next person is just full of energy, just can't wait to get going, and they start getting off. And what you've got to do is you've got to strain to put that baton in their hand. Strain. Paul is saying here, I'm straining for that complete resurrection body, that complete self. I'm going to go for it. How do you do that? Well, here's where we look at verse 15. All of us then who are, here's a key word, mature should take such a view of things. If on some other thing, point you think differently, God will make it clear. Maturity. Being mature. Living as mature people. Look at your complete self and look at your mature. You don't let little things rattle you. You're the kind of person that can be consistently calm even though other people are agitated. You can be the kind of presence that has the influence that when others are telling jokes that you know are totally off color, totally off base, everybody else is laughing. You can calmly just smile, but not laugh. 
you're mature. You recognize that there's all kinds of things that can be developed in that maturity. Um, and so I look through um, Philippians again, and I look at the beginning of chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When you're having disagreements with people, <laughs> don't push your own way. Let them have their way. You don't need to have your way. Where are we going to have Thanksgiving this year? Well, I want it here. I want it here. I want it here. Okay. I think we could have it here. Doesn't matter to me. You can have your way. A mature person doesn't always have to have their way. I look later into chapter 2. To be kind and decent with difficult people. To help people out to be willing to help and give and to be cheerful about it. Somebody needs some help and you need some other. <laughs> give and give and give. You see, this is all part of the resurrection, to be this mature person. I'm talking about maturity. Um, did we? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, let's go into verse 17. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have a model, keep your eyes, keep your eyes on those who as, live as we do. Um, <clears throat> part of living maturely is to imitate other people. Let me give you a couple examples. I think I've told some of you that my father-in-law, he's still living in Tucson, Arizona. Um, he was a mountain lion hunter, a professional guide for mountain lion hunting. And uh, he wanted to do some training with the, the second most prominent lion hunter in, in the United States, Dale Lee. And I got to meet him. And um, he says, this is a way I learned from him. I asked him if I could go on some hunts with him, and he let me do it. But I didn't pepper him with questions. I just watched him. How did he handle his hounds? How did he look for the track? How did he call his dogs when they had to go back on the track? How did he know when they were following a deer track instead of a mountain lion track? What would he do once the tree was, once the lion was treed? He just watched him, every single move he made. And he said, that's how I started doing lion hunting. I took note of that. And so there's been a number of times over the years I've faced a real hard situation, either in a church board or among members of the congregation or in the community, and I just don't know what to do. You know what I do? I think about people that were really mature in my life, solid people, people that I want to be like. And I think, well, Klaus Grun, a farmer that I worked for at one time, I would say, how would Klaus handle this? And man, did that help. Here's Paul saying, how do you achieve towards that mature, complete self? Live maturely and particularly think of people that are mature and imitate them. That's part of becoming that new self. By the way, that's why it's important that we always have children, that our children have them be around godly people as much as possible. Okay. So Paul is saying here, <clears throat> here's my goal. The resurrection. The complete self. How do I get there? Forgetting what is behind. Straining towards what ahead. I'm already starting to head there. I'm not going to wait. Now, we're going to get to what I think is the best, most important part here. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
Greek readers, I know we have a couple in here. <clears throat> if you want to, you can look that up. You look at the word heavenward, it's not there. It's not the word heavenward. It's actually, and here's a blank, it's the word upward. Upward. And yeah, I can understand, okay, if God is calling you upward, where is God? God, Father, God in heaven, okay, okay. All right, so if it's upward, it's bound to be heaven, right? Nope. God's calling isn't heaven, even though that's part of it. But that's not the calling here. What's the calling here? The calling, okay, I'll read that verse again. I'll press on towards the goal to win the price for which God has called me upward in Christ Jesus. Now notice what Paul is doing here. I have this resurrection body all in mind. I want to be like that, but now the calling of God isn't just that. I have to move a little bit and shift my goal. My goal is Jesus Christ himself. That's who I'm straining for. Because later on, um, do we have this? Oh, yeah, verse 20. Uh, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be, notice this, like his glorious body. What does that mean? What it means is this. Let's not get just fixated on my complete self at the end. No matter how pleasant that is, no matter how valid that is to think about. Make it even more concrete. Look at the living Lord Jesus Christ right now in his glorious body, his whole complete self, the perfect image of the Father. Have that as your goal. Have the Lord Jesus Christ himself be your goal to be just like him because you're going to be like him anyway in the end. That helps explain that for verse 1, the, the versification of the verses were added centuries later. This should be part of it. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom you, I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. What does that mean? What that means for you and me this week, if that's our goal, to be like Jesus, I would like to challenge you and ask you, what is one way that you can be more like Jesus this week? Is there some squabble that you need to deal with and you need to go through the work and energy of dealing with a squabble and go through the agony of forgiving? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who on the cross, when they were nailing him and taunting him, he said, Father, forgive them. Ask the Lord Jesus, Give me your ability to forgive. When you're just tired of giving and giving and helping and helping and you're just tired out and you don't know if you can keep going again. Do you see Jesus? When the crowds were coming and he was already tired, he had compassion on them. He felt sorry for them, and he just gave some more. When he saw some people that were doing wrong, the way they were treating the people, driving people away from God, even the religious leaders, <laughs> boldly standing up to them, maybe 
You're going to need to have some boldness, the boldness of Jesus this week. And do you feel distant from God? Maybe this is a week that you just come, need to come closer to your God, your Father. Look at Jesus getting away from everybody for a while and just spending time with his Father. And you can just run with this. Whatever you need to do this week, whatever goals, you, what, could it be that you need to take one step closer to being like Jesus? So the next time somebody asks you, what are your goals in life? What do you think you'd say? I would hope that my answer would be one of the main goals I have is to be a bit more like Jesus. Let us pray. How we thank you so much, O oh God, for calling us. You call us to yourself. You call us to your son. You want us to be like him. Fill us with your spirit so that we can truly become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.